Previously, I made a very popular video on how to balance a planted aquarium when it comes to juggling the light, nutrients, and carbon dioxide, or CO2. But today, let's dive deeper into plant nutrient deficiencies. I want to talk about how exactly did I figure out what nutrients my plants were missing, um, the exact nutrient test kits I used, as well as what is my fertilization schedule today. Hi, my name is Irene with Girl Talks Fish, here with practical tips for busy fish keepers like you. And let's talk about food. So when it comes to humans, we've got that food pyramid that tells us you should eat a lot of fruits and vegetables. And at the very top, you should eat very little healthy fats, for example. Well, plants have a similar thing. They need a lot of the macronutrients like nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, and then very few of the you know, trace amounts of the micronutrients. Now, in my previous video on balancing a planted tank, I talked about Liebig's law of limiting factors, which basically says the plant growth is capped by whatever nutrient or factor it is missing or it uses up first. And therefore, there's a couple of schools of thought when it comes to balancing a tank. Estimated index or EI dosing, fertilization dosing, says, okay, if plant growth is capped by whatever nutrient it's missing, why don't we just flood the water with tons of nutrients? And then we can just worry about tuning the lighting and the CO2 amount, okay? However, I would say this method is best for a heavily planted, um, more high maintenance kind of tank because you're definitely gonna be doing weekly large water changes as well as lots of pruning because you're gonna be growing tons and tons of plants. Now, the other school of thought is kind of a lean dosing method where, okay, let's instead set the lighting and maybe the CO2 if you're using it at a certain amount, and then we're gonna fine tune the nutrients in order to balance the tank. And we're going to use just the bare minimum amount of nutrients that the plants need to grow. And this method is better for, let's say if you have lower light, slower growing plants, or maybe your plant, uh, your planted tank isn't full of plants yet, this leaner dosing might be the way to go. And so since I am a lazy, low maintenance kind of girl, that's the route I choose to go with. Of course, the all important question you're probably thinking is, so where is this plant nutrient food chart, food pyramid <laughs> that I can use? Well, unfortunately, I found a lot of varying opinions on the internet, so I put them all on a chart over here. You can check it out. And you can see there's a wide range of parameters of how much phosphorus or potassium, et cetera, people think you should have. And I think that is because some of these tanks maybe are more of a low tech tank versus a high tech setting. Um, people's water is also different. And a lot of times in the articles I'm reading, they don't really specify what kind of tank they're trying to set up. So I put all the information there so we can kind of use that as a guideline maybe uh, to try to aim for. So let's rewind back into time and we're gonna use my 20 gallon back to basics planted tank as our case study. Basically, I was sick and tired of having algae and dying plant problems. So I reset the whole tank. I used Eco Complete Substrate, um, ordered the easiest, most beginner friendly plants possible. And then the light up here is a Fluval 3.0 LED, which I just found a schedule online and I copied it. Now, within a few weeks, I already had just tons of algae, like green hair, staghorn, black beard, you name it, I had it. And so we're gonna test it, right? We gotta try to solve this problem scientifically. So this was the purpose of this back to basics tank. Now I had been regularly measuring nitrate levels and it was just consistently always too low, no matter how much fertilizer I put in. So I realized the problem was my starting point. Remember I said with lean dosing, we typically set the light and the, well, for me, I'm not using CO2. So we set the light and we leave it. Well, my starting point for the light was way too high. So first thing I did was decrease the light intensity down to 30%, much dimmer. Therefore the plants are gonna grow um, not as quickly and therefore they don't need to eat as much. And then the second thing was just continue to dose easy green fertilizer to make sure I have enough nitrate. Once I started raising my nitrate levels to appropriate amounts, it was amazing. The, the algae started going away actually. However, the plants still had large holes in the leaves, which I was really confused about because, hey, my nitrate level is good, right? However, remember I said the, micro the macronutrients include um, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, right? So it's time to get test kits for 
phosphate and potassium. Once I had these two babies, yes, I determined that although my nitrate levels were good, I actually had low amounts of these two things. So my, I figured, well, I guess my all-in-one fertilizer must not be enough. I went ahead and decided to go down the rabbit hole of dosing individual fertilizers. So I got Seachem Flourish Phosphorus as well as Flourish Advance, which contains mostly potassium, but also some other um, trace nutrients as well. The immediate effect from that was all my crypts melted away, my cryptocorines, which I was so sad about because I was like, hey, I adjusted my fertilization schedule so that you guys would thrive, but they're really sensitive to changes in their environment. And so they all went away and really never recovered afterwards, which was a bummer, but hey, you can always buy more. Now adding more phosphorus and the Flourish Advance did seem to help some. However, I did notice that the Aponagetan, the Dwarf Aquarium Lily, as well as the Java Fern, which is supposed to be like the easiest beginner plant ever, they all still had giant holes in them. So I changed a few things. For the Java Fern, I found out they actually apparently consume a lot of potassium. So instead of using the Flourish Advance, which has about 0.45% potassium, I switched to the straight up Flourish Potassium, which has 6% potassium in it, much stronger. Also, for the bulb plants specifically, the Dwarf Aquarium Lily and the Ponagin, they just needed more root tabs. I was definitely pretty lax about how often and how many root tabs I would put in there. So I just made a note in my schedule, have a monthly reminder go, and then made sure to extra pump them full of um, extra fertilizer in the substrate. Chapter four. I know, you guys are like, this woman cannot, has the blackest thumb ever. <laughs> But I noticed my Pogostem Salatus octopus was getting like curled tips to its leaves. And so I was like, huh, I think that's a calcium deficiency problem. I will link this blog post I made for Aquarium Co-op down in the description, but there's kind of some general pictures that sometimes help. Anyways, what I needed to measure was another water kit, this time for GH and KH. I really only care about GH, general hardness, which refers to the minerals in the water, including calcium. And turns out it was pretty low. I think coming out of my tap water was about three degrees, which apparently was a not enough to keep my plants living. So my new best friend is Seachem Equilibrium Minerals, which is basically calcium, magnesium, bunch of other stuff that I'm apparently missing in my water. I love it. If you have soft water, I swear by this stuff. Chapter five is a very fond period because uh, the plant, planted tank ended up maturing, things were stabilizing, and I did not have to dose all these individual fertilizers anymore. Instead, I just had to do my two pumps of the all-in-one easy green fertilizer, and then anytime the GH or mineral level went down, I would just add some equilibrium. Such a wonderful time in my life. However, the peace was temporary because I made the decision to add platies to this tank. Love them. However, they are live bears. And what do live bears do? They eat a lot. They breed a lot. I feel sorry for the fry, so I feed them more. And what do you know? I have a high bio load situation now. Chapter six is basically the opposite of chapter one, where now my nitrate level was way too high and I don't want to be doing large weekly water changes. Remember, lazy person here. Thankfully, the nutrient deficiency I spotted was pretty easy to recognize, which is the pinholes in the leaves. And that is generally uh, a sure sign of potassium uh, deficiency. So added more flourish potassium and boom, as soon as I did that, the nitrate level, nitrate level started dropping. So this goes back to our Liebig's barrel analogy. In that barrel, the plank that was the shortest, the nutrient that was missing was potassium. And as soon as I added it, all the plants started growing better. Did I really need to get all those tests? Probably not, but I felt like it was worth the money, at least for me, because I really learned a lot about plant nutrients during that particular saga that I went through. I would say nowadays, the tests I actually use would be 
um, multi-test strips, which already have, I pay attention to the nitrate and the GH most on this. And then that's tested every week. I would say if I see a problem with the plants where they have the large hole problem again, I go back to my phosphate and potassium kits. And then I have a few kits that I've basically only used once just to try them out and see what they were like. So that includes, we got uh, calcium, iron, as well as this little CO2 kit over here. Again, uh, didn't see anything spectacularly out of range, which is why I don't really use them, but yeah. As for my fertilization schedule, which is my personal fertilization schedule for my particular tap water, the plants I keep, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I, honestly, I should make a flow chart for this, but if nitrate is around I don't know, 10 to 25 ppm, I will add some more easy green to get that back up. If nitrate is more than 50 ppm, and I don't want to get too high, I will dose some potassium. If my GH is, I don't know, six degrees or below, definitely time for some equilibrium minerals. And then if my ball plants um, aren't looking so good or my cryptocorines have leaves that are turning yellow, definitely gotta have some root tabs. So between the four of these things, I am basically able to do no water changes on most of my aquariums. Like really, it's just if there's evaporation loss, I just top it off with tap water and that's it. Really cool. I hope you guys are able to get there if you were lazy like me. If you need to dive into any part of the planted aquarium, like what substrate should I get? What about the lighting? I have a whole playlist over here of the top five things I wish I had known about these specific parts of the planted aquarium hobby. Take time to enjoy your aquariums and I'll see you in the next video.